different age, the knowledge level of the group, which is very odd to me, and so primarily physicists. So if I'm going fast, as a so, especially if I use physics jargon, which in a comfort of Google, then please also interrupt me. Okay, so yeah, today's talk is is on UV things. The work is based on two papers that can be published this year together with a Colin Brody. With a postdoc at Virginia Tech, Andre Constantine. Today, um, Stephen Hawking Fellow in Oxford, Andre Lucas. The professor in Oxford and the cell. And I give you the archive numbers. Actually, Van, sorry to interrupt. It's 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 a little faint. Your your handwriting is very clear, but be, I think because of the different distance between the camera and the board, the the, the writing is a little small. So it, it, this is not sorry. This is not on you. I, maybe maybe Vance can can maybe put the camera a little bit closer. If, if, uh, if uh, <laughs> I know I know what yes. that, that's going to mean that you will we see. I think I can. Maybe push the other yeah. Area. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe we can pick a ball, but that's how it looks on my computer. I don't know how it looks on other other it, remote. Just, it will just lose the top board. Is that okay? Yes, the glare is an issue, but we can, if you pop the button, that made it worse. Let's keep the light on. That made it. That does make it worse on on, yeah. on computer screen anyway. I will try to write a little bit thicker by changing the position. I hope it's strong, and I hope that works. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, paper from April. <clears throat> oh, you have to tell me how, how high I can go. Oh, you, you're just starting to cut off. Okay. On the top. On the bottom, you totally cut Like that? That's perfect. Okay, cool. Um, so the outline. Follows. And first, I will briefly tell you how we describe the kind of analysis we are interested in. Second, I will discuss the structure of the calico. I want to talk about infinitely many episodes. A conjecture due to Karamat and Morrison. What is called uh, in physics the Swanson Swanson distance conjecture SDC, and I will explain what that is. And finally, I will come to the GD in uh, in the Calabria manifold. So for one, two, and three, essentially what I'm saying is doesn't rely on having the power in two. For the GD, they could work out the Picard rank 2 case, so H11 equals 2. So, the way I started this was I thought I could put this all the way up 
So I hope you have read it so I can move it out of the way. Yeah, when it's all the way up, basically everything below the archive listings we can read. Okay. So the bottom half is still yeah. safe. No. Okay. So let's, let's start with the first part. So essentially what we do here is um, this is just, just like a bunch of examples which um, they can deal with and do computations with. And so the two sets of examples have emerged by mathematicians. So the first one is the set of complete intersections. A product of projected um, spaces. So you choose a union space A, which is given by the product of complex projected space of some dimension. And then you're choosing as many hypersurfaces within these or writing down a set of ideals of a certain degree, such that you cancel the anti canonical bundle on the hypersurface such that you have the color DR property. And the second example are just hypersurfaces. In toric I mean spaces. And for the toric I mean spaces, if you want, we are only looking at color of three folds. The number of both of these are finite. So the number of um, body toric varieties that are described by um, by polyhedra that admit a fine regular star triangulation is uh, finite. They have been classified by uh, Kreutzmann and Stark, and there are half a billion of these. Complete sections have been classified by Candelas and collaborators. And there are roughly 8,000 of these. So, we have this playground of um, quality of we are investigating, and everything I will be saying, everything we have done here is sort of based on this intuition of physics. So, usually in physics, we don't think about quality of very abstractly, but we are really thinking about things that um, come out of one of these two constructions. What's their category? The category is actually a very important quantity in physics. It, um, it has implications for uh, the, the modelized phase of these cardiac and cardiac manifolds have implications for the physics that comes out of string theory when you. Um, when you describe string theory with this uh, Calabial manifold, so the catacomb you just have to be, I wrote a note with a script K, and this is just the open. Given by the set of color classes. So, color the hours, the color manifold, and the color column contains a set of color classes. The closure of the color column is called map code. And 
and we also need a movable car. So this that's called the extended car account. Finally, another cone we will be looking at is the effective cone. That's just the cone generated by the effective device. Move on one point. Good. So now, if you want to, um, if you want to look at the catacone of the Carvial, typically um, we start with the catacone of the ambient space. So we look at, um, for example, at P two, an example of an ambient space which has a power two. Let's not take this. Let's say I take an, I take an arbitrary I mean space of the powering two. Then I will have a color class, my color class, and be specified by three integers T1. Or the time of the code will be spent by T1 and T2. Real numbers and D1 and D2 are the generators of the catacomb. And so typically, this and the catacomb is then the positive problem. This uh, the colony contains the catacomb classes. Then you have some, so this would be sort of this would be the catacomb. Then you can have some other regions where. This is formally ne formally negative, or as the two is formally negative, and the other one is positive. And you can study this um, using what's called gauging and sigma models in physics. And then finally, if both are negative, you read something which is called the Van der Waals theory. So, but so from the ambient space perspective, it seems like the calicone, especially when you have a product of protective space, the calicone. Is typically just sort of the, the positive products. So, the um, question is um, what is the color cone of the Carvial manifold? And the color cone of the Carvial manifold is um, at least as big as the color cone of the Ambient space, it could be bigger. So, when we now study the examples for the color cone and the um, on the Carvel manifold, what we found is sometimes it looks just like this, but surprisingly often we found a richer structure. Let's say this was a cone of the Carvel. Then we found another cone with a flop in the tree. So this is geometry one. This is geometry two. Maybe another one, geometry three. Geometry four. And outside is um, so. Let's say these are color. So this 
would be the boundaries of the effective cone. So the effective cone would, would be all of that. And the extended catacomb would be, or the movable cone would be uh, the catacomb of D1, D2, D3, and D4. And so in between these, these, so these catacombs are glued along topological transitions, which are plot transitions, which means that if, if you move across this boundary of the catacomb, the volume of some curve becomes formally negative, but then we can sort of resolve the geometry by plotting this curve and going to a different geometry. So first of all, for us, it was surprising that the ambient space has a very simple catacomb and the Caldeo manifolds that are just described in terms of hypersurfaces inside this have this complicated structure here. That, yeah, that's a very good question. I was going to come to this. So the question was, and um, how do you describe these other geometries? Are they can they be described in the same ambient space? By the way, what's your name? Uh, I'm Josh. Okay. I'm Josh. Right. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Josh. Good. Um, so indeed, if you started with a with, with a complete intersection description, you would only get this cone. If you wanted to describe the other cones as well, you would have to change the description. Typically, and um, you can construct them. Typically, what you get are determinantal varieties, or you get net partitions of higher dimensionality varieties. So, if you leave, yeah. So, maybe that's a way of saying it. So, if you just take this a simple ambient space, you only see this simple cone. If you then go to a more complicated description, indeed, you see that that you get these, these other cones as well. I mean, from, from the toric case, this was a little bit more expected because already in the toric ambient space, you can perform flops. And then, so you would expect at least sort of seeing, let's say, if you have one flop in your toric, in your toric ambient space that you can do, you have the T1 and the T2, and the flop of the ambient space would carry over to a flop on the color of the out. However, this also is not always the case. You can flop a curve that's not on the color of the out, for example. So in this case, you flop the ambient space, but the the cone of the geometries would just sort of be the union of the cone of the two different phases of the onion space. Yeah. So the way that we um, identify these different cones, by the way, is um, we compute um, the cohomologies using on, on the color of the sort of starting from the onion space and using either Cauchy resolutions or uh, spectrum is to compute the uh, compute the cohomologies, and then we use uh, Kodaira vanishing theorem to state um, in which cases sort of um, we are inside the effective cone, because in the effective cone only the zero cohomology is not trivial. Good. So then we were asking: now that we have this, we sort of see these um, transitions on these walls are flopped transitions and these we can just construct and check pretty explicitly so we can compute for example the gram of written invariance of the curves that is flopped we see how many curves are in this curve class and then we see that the new geometry has a has a change in the triple intersection numbers as you would expect from and in the second term class for example as you would say expect from a flop they just sort of checking that the gram of written invariance that yeah, the triple intersection, for example, uh, changed by the uh, form of written invariance. Good. So we are asking him what happens. So what is happening at these other walls? You'll see.
eventually I'm, we find that three different things happen. Here we get uh, a plot wall, which is what I just said. So the, the volume of some curve goes to zero, but the volume of devices and the volume of the entire color VRX stay finite. Then and there's a second type of thing that can happen, and we call these as Sarisky walls, which is not a very good name for them. But it's stuck because then we started from a 2D case and then went to the 3D case, and the 2D case is these have an interpretation in terms of Sarisky decompositions. In 3D, we don't know, but we took the name, probably it's probably it's a bad name for, for the 3D case. And here the volume from the divider goes to zero. Now the volume of the car the hour stays finite. And then thirdly, there's the effective cone wall. The volume of the car the hour goes to zero. In the Zeristi case, we actually distinguish two cases whether or not the divisor shrinks to a point or whether the divisor collapses to a curve at, at, the, at the wall. So we make two observations. First observation is that you can flop, let's say, from D1 to D2, and D1 and D2 can be isomorphic as manifolds. So that's one, one observation that um, yeah, D1, D2 can be sort of the same manifold, they could be different. The second observation is that the Zariski walls are always the sec sort of the last wall before the end of the effective cone. So you cannot have this couldn't be a Zariski wall, then you go here and then you go back to some other geometry. At least so for the cases we saw, this didn't happen. The answer is I don't want to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> so what we looked at was um, was eleven dimensional entry compactified down to down to five dimensions on Caldeo three folds. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. And in that case, um, you only get the real part. Yes, 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 yes. And the reason why we did this is because later when you wanted to compute the geodesics, we we wanted to have full control of the metric in, in the color modelized space. Uh -huh. And if you do this in 5D and 3, then the, um, the metric is protected from free potential and it's protected against renormalization after one loop. And the effect that changes, so, so you can compute the contribution written did this at, at the plot wall to the yes. metric. Yeah, if there is a real, there is just fine. Yeah. yeah. And so if the contributions are exactly such that the triple of the section numbers change exactly the way you want them to change, that's, that's the extent of what the metric is correct. So um, yeah, I haven't thought of, we haven't thought much about what it, what it would mean in 4D with that right. Are the list of like walls actually the same as like the list of like level variational contractions? Probably like it's probably the same classification. Yeah, it, it, it probably is, yeah, but um, yeah, I think this is all. I'm talking about three to directly correspond to your like the three the three possibilities. Yeah, so yeah, I think this is the only thing that that essentially can happen. Um, although probably, I mean, you know, this probably better in in the case of type three where they have the arguments. Yes. Probably there was a subclassification of. Of how fast? Yeah, sort of 
the volume trends by the divisor stays finite, whereas the volume trend of the curve stays finite. So there are these probably these different sets. Yeah, and then so we didn't we didn't or at least now over these different subclasses did make a difference. So all, all that had mattered was that the volume typicality of was to zero. Whereas for the um, the metric at the risky wall, it mattered whether or not the curve collapsed, sorry, the divider collapsed to a curve versus the divider collapsed to a point. So we had to make this distinction for the what's called the risky wall, but we didn't have to make this distinction for the for the end of the effective curve. Good. So, um, in cases where where you have a flop to an where you have a flop to an isomorphic uh, the algorithm, let's say these are again the caliper means one and d two, and you have a geometry d one and d two. Then, so sort of what is happening then is this is the shared shared generator of both calicones. And the generator of this catacomb after the flop is identified with the generator of the isomorphic color BO along this direction. So then the catacomb is taken and it's, it's mirrored along here. And this, this axis is, or this generator in from I mean, one is then identified with um, this generator in the, in the, in the mirror case. So this is again. Yeah, Two, two isomorphic caliphs, but it could of course happen that this happens along both generators. So you can go to G2 here and G3 here. And now of course you could repeat this as all next life. So you take D1, you flip it on the here, D2, but now I can also flop along the other way, so I will get G3. I can flop along the other way, I get G4 and so on. So I get this, this infinite amount of calicons of both, both sides. I just repeatedly flopping along one or the other direction. So we can compute, for example, how this uh, triple intersection on this change. So I denote by DIJK intersection form of the three divisors. And I assume that I flop and curves. In the curve class C, where so and one of them are in the, that's in the curve class C and and two of so I thought n curves and one are in the curve class C and then two are in the curve class two C and it's just in one class. So let's say I'm flopping along T1 equals zero, then the triple intersection numbers will change as Like this, and I can write this as I can write this as DIJK is DAEC times M one AI and one DJ. For these matrices. And um, 
I just sort of I just these reflections along along the generator. So M1 will just be minus one one zero and some number M1. And likewise, if I was plotting along T2 equals zero, I would get a matrix M2, which is one minus one, I mean the two and zero. And these M1 and M2, they are related to the to the triple intersection numbers and M1 and M2. I won't write down how they are just, 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 just an expression for them. So now we're asking of what type of group M1 and M2 are not commuting, what type of group do they generate? And so they are reflections, so M1 squared is equal to M2 squared zero. Identity. So um, the group can be written or can be given with the presentation one and two. And to study it, we found it easy to define the generator S, which is M1, and the generator T, which is M1 and 2. This is order two, this is order infinity. And the whole group is equal to the free product. There's an, a special case, so we need to assume that M1 and that the product M1 times M2 has to be large or equal to four. Otherwise, when I did this continuous reflection, M1 and M2 are in the sense the slopes here. And if this was less than a quarter and I did this reflection, I would sort of go around all the way here. The effective cone wouldn't, wouldn't be convex. So that can't happen. But it's already interesting that this can't happen because these M1s and M2s are essentially just Combinations of chromophyton variants and triple intersection numbers. So the fact that this can't happen tells you that certain color VLs can't exist. The color VLs with certain intersection numbers just can't exist. And there are not so many because this happens very quickly, but at least sort of some of them are just ruled out of principle. And we don't know what's, what's wrong with them otherwise. But we can sort of just we can compute what the what the limiting what the limiting slope of the movable cone would be if I just keep on reflecting sort of what are what are the boundaries of the of the movable cone. Or in this case, we actually find that this is always the extended cone. I mean, you so there, there can be no other cone in the tree. So if this is some geometry, this is a Equivalent geometry, this is an equivalent geometry. And you keep on plopping, we found that we find that sort of this. I mean, this has sort of equivalent geometries for both sides of it. So it would sort of the movable cone would be the extended catalog cone. And then we find that the uh, this is movable cone and we find that the, the, the slopes of these of the two and um, bounds of the extended color cone and one triple and then and one triple and then two triple are given by m1 
am I of the two? So where am I just the entry in these matrices? Okay, one plus square root of one minus four over one over two. So you can see um, this is the irrational number for so yeah, this is an irrational number for m one and two larger than four. For m one and two equals four, it is it's rational and for yeah, and you can see that it doesn't make sense if m one and two is smaller than four or smaller than four. So now the uh, Kavamata Morrison conjecture essentially says that the movable column is always rational polyhedral. In other words, up to uh, up to automorphisms. So in other, in other words, well, all of these different ones are of course are automorphic. So while it looks like we have all these, these different geometries, that really just sort of this one pattern. So this uh, this works, and this has actually been proven. So the cover of Morrison contract has been proven for cases of Picard too, which are the ones that I, I draw through here. But these cases, so these examples also occur in higher dimensions. So if they have Picard four, your if your telecom will of course have some walls, and if two of them are, so if two uh, plots along two of them also lead to um, I think out of the outset, then you can do the same. You can plot along. On one, then along the other, along one, then the other, and you will sort of get get a picture analogous to this. So there are examples where you can play the same game in higher Picard rank uh, manifolds, and in this case, the cover of other Morrison conjecture is just a conjecture. So, um, what cannot happen according to the cover of other Morrison conjecture is a picture like this. Where all of these keys are inequivalent. And the column would not be rational polyhedral because the boundaries are not. Um, so this means that, yeah, you cannot have this infinite flops to more and more uh, to, to different color VRs. And this is very much related to a conjecture that came up in physics, and this is the uh, Swarmland distance conjecture. So the Swarmland distance conjecture is essentially making the following statement. It says pick a point the two points one and two in the modelized space and then it says if you consider strings here in this color VR and you look at the masses of the particles that you have at point two, these are given in terms of the masses at point one times e to the minus alpha v e of one e two, where alpha is an order one constant according to the conjecture, and p one and p two are other two points in the. Uh, so p is the, two, the shortest PD distance between p1 and p2 in the modelized space. So what this means in particular is that if p goes to infinity, you have an infinite, I mean, yeah, you have an infinite tower of, of essentially massless particles because yeah, so all of these masses are coming down and you would expect to see infinitely many essentially massless springs. So the equation so for this is of course, so you, if you have an, Yeah, so let's say if you have a torus, then you have a spring running around the A cycle or the B cycle. And now let's say you're making this torus, you're making the A cycle smaller. What's happening is that um, this the string running around the A cycle, the mass of the spring is given by the, it has a tension, so the mass is given by the volume of this uh, of the cycle essentially. And when you make it smaller and smaller, it's becoming lighter and lighter. Okay. Conversely, if I was making um, sort of if I was making the, the, the A cycle larger and larger, the, um, the the dimension gets larger and larger, and then what's happening is the so-called state states become 
answers. So, so physically, this is well motivated, either in either the winding states, they wind around once or twice or three times become masses, or if you make it very large, then the winding states become very heavy, but the Kaluza Klein states that live in this extra dimension become, become lighter and lighter. And so sort of the heart of some of the distance conjectures, this is all that can happen. And then either the dual strings become applied. That's that's what I like. So the question now is um, what would happen if so assuming this is correct, does this what does this tell us about the carbon matter more conjecture? Well, first of all, if all the G's are all the geometries are isomorphic, then um, physics tells you that you also should only consider like one cone as a fundamental domain. All of the other ones would be would be gauged. You need to divide up the symmetry and so you need to divide all the automorphisms, and you're only really dealing with one geometry in this case. If you have many different geometries, like infinite chain of oh, non equivalent uh, geometries, this would mean that if I start, for example, here, P1, and I'm moving to some other point, P2, and while I do so, I cross an arbitrary large number of geometries. And if I assume furthermore that the number that, that the GDP distance of crossing infinitely many or an arbitrary large number of, um, of geometries indeed um, goes to infinity, goes to infinity, so they are not the catacombs are not becoming arbitrarily small at in GDP distance at the same time, then this would mean that in a given color BR after doing this for long enough, I encounter an infinite tower of massive states. And this is what's happening in string theory. So we know that inside the catacomb of a given color the manifold, we always only have a finite number of mass strings we can compute them. So this means that the situation like this cannot occur if this form the distance for conjecture is correct. So this form the distance conjecture would imply <coughs> or not a more conjecture on the assumption on the distance of the carrier cones and can have traverse them. Is it expected? I mean, do people have an intuition about whether the conjecture is likely true? I mean, yeah, most people not most people believe it's true. So this is indeed the only thing that can happen. Um, there have been many other cross checks that we so so the last five years of physics or so I've seen a lot of the conjectures emerging about. Things that are true in quantum quantum theory of gravity in general, mm -hmm. based on like whole arguments or based on whatever type of intuition you have. Also, just physics going wrong, you won't be able to write down the consistency we need to do scattering of, of the of particles, for example. And then, so there are many arguments to believe that it's correct. But most people I know believe it's correct. Sorry, I think I got confused between infinitely many states versus just finitely many but an un unbounded number as you keep going what how did you get infinitely many states well yeah no so that's right so you will always have a finite number but okay. compared to where you started so you will have in the end you will have an arbitrary large number of states that are arbitrarily light okay and in physics th this doesn't happen you only have um, yeah, essentially, you, you, you have no like, I mean, you can compute the, the masses part of the state, and then you have a gap, a mass gap, and then the rest of the states come. You don't have sort of this state being very, very light when you are just somewhere in your color the other geometry. Sure. Well, I, I just don't see the implication of the Swampland distance conjecture to the Kawamata Morrison cone conjecture. Are, are you saying that implication follows after additional physical input? So, the assumptions that go into here is um, the strong distance conjecture is true. Okay. And the um, the distance that I that it takes to the, the catacombs are not getting arbitrarily small such that I can such, such that this D here is growing as far as big as I want when I go through as many cones as I want. Uh -huh. and then, so there's not a very sharp bone, but at least we know that. And there's, there are no physical examples where I have, I don't know, 
I don't know, 10 to the 100 light states or so. So then, if my GDZ, if I can get to a GDZ distance of 10 to the 100, uh -huh. then I know that um, this, um, yeah, so I, I know that this wouldn't be a physical model. Uh, okay. It, it sounds like you're saying physical input gives you the Kawamata Morrison cone conjecture, which, okay, I mean, fine, good. Yeah, it's based on physics. Yeah. Okay. It, it's not like literally the swampland distance conjecture, but that's fine. And uh, is it possible, and, or, and you can tell me if I should just ask again after your talk, to say what some of those checks of the swampland distance conjecture are, at least if they're mathematical? No, they are all physical. So they're there's something about completeness of charge analysis. One is, so one is the statement yeah, that all charges that you can have in a, in, a, in a theory are actually populated. So if I have a, a theory which has a Lie algebra, I don't know. Uh -huh. But let's say I just have a U1 theory and I have a okay. particle charge one, then I would also have a particle charge two, three, four, and, and so on. And I would have all these populated. And this has also to do with this. Power. Populated by DPS states or just by any states? There are different versions. One says by DPS, one says by any. But that would contradict the integral Hodge, or that would imply the integral Hodge conjecture in particular, which we don't believe. Interesting. What, what's the conjecture? No, just if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, I could set up some, uh, let's say, 2D CFT, which mm -hmm. is given by a sigma model to whatever Klabia or whatever. Kähler manifold of any dimension uh, that is dual to some ADS3 theory of quantum gravity. And, and maybe the point is you want asymptotically Minkowski instead of ADS, I don't know what you want. Uh, then the integral Hodge classes, I would assume are part of your charge lattice. Those are guys that should be populated, uh, but being populated by a BPS state would mean that we've got some actual algebraic cycle that whose turn, whose turn class is that integral Hodge class. In other words, you'd be saying you'd be predicting that all integral Hodge classes are actually realized by algebraic cycles, and that's false. I see. Okay, then, then probably this, this, this strong version of the conjecture is false. Then it's just any particle, I guess. So, so I've, I've heard about some of these conjectures before, and I'm just always very confused because it seems like you can make strong versions that are false and weak versions that might be true. So I, I'm, I'm always hopeful that people who like talk to mathematicians like you do could, could tell me a bit more like which checks are, have been checked in mathematical statements that are like meaningful to me, as opposed to just like, uh, I don't know, maybe something is true. But I, I can ask you again after your talk. I don't mean to like no, send I mean, you on a huge diversion great. right now. That sounds great. You should definitely have a coffee and discuss this. <laughs> so can, can, can I know your name? Arnoff Tripathy. Arnoff, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we could great to further discuss this. I mean, I was based on the statement that like holes need to be K. Okay. These are all the weakest, weakest statements. Um, but there it's not even clear what, what would go physically wrong if they wouldn't decay, other than people say, okay, maybe then they would fill up the universe and the universe couldn't be expanding the way we see it. But these are also very loose bounds. Okay. Okay. All right, 10 more minutes. Okay. I'm not, right after my talk, I have to run to, to a different presentation, but. I would be happy to okay. gotcha. do something with you. Sure. So the, the last part we then looked at at what these QDs actually look like. Essentially, we wanted to see whether or not um, this can happen that they get an arbitrarily small. And so we denote the, um, the p potential by half time, this is just given by the sum of dijk, dijk, dk. And with this, the metric is just given by minus the third yeah. so these are these also are Kala. 
and you can just compute the metric from the driven intersection of this. And now, if we define two quantities, first one is what we call the class of kappa. This is just the cardinality set of um, the coordinates to one to two, taking as real protective space coordinates. And you impose that and yeah, you impose that kappa. That's the number of zeros, number of distinct zeros that and that is and trilinear form kappa has, and the rank. That's the rank, the matrix rank of the matrix B one one one, B one one two, B one two two, B one one two, B one two two, B two two two. But together with this, we can classify the different cases that can can appear. So all Pitarian two manifolds can be written in one of these four ways. The one that would just be G one cube. Or they can be written as in T1 cubed plus T2 cubed. Or they can be written as T1, T2 cubed plus T1 squared T2. Or they can be written as T1 squared T2 plus T1 T2 squared. These are the four possibilities you can have. And so if the class and the rank are one comma one, then you get to this. Long, we can bring it into this form. If they are one two, you can bring it into this form. If they are two two, then we brought into this form. And if they are three two, then we brought into this form. So you need we are, you only need to compute these two quantities to see sort of what what the free potential looks like. And this you know what the metric looks like. And from this you can then you can compute the geodesics. For all these four different cases. So I should say, we continue this table. We also compute it in so where the Kähler cone is. So the Kähler cone in this case is just empty. So this is not, not a very interesting compactification. In this case, the Kähler cone is contained in, in this region. And so that this just comes from demanding that this metric here, so that Kappa is positive. And the metric is positive definite. Yeah, maybe I, so I'll write the four different kind of ones up here. Okay, okay zero has an empty catacomb. Case one. This catacomb. Case two. This catacomb where this is both taken out, why it's is taken out, in case three, this catacomb. So what I can do is I can take the catacomb of my Calabiar manifold. This has for any fixed Calabiar manifold, this has fixed triple intersection numbers. I can compute the free potential. I can compute the class and the rank. I know which um, which of the four types it is, so I can 
work out how to map it into one of these um, these four forms I have. I can take the generators of the color, cone of the color VR, and it will be either the entire color cone here, or it will be a proper subcone of, um, of one of these three color cones. And um, then we can compute the geodesics. And um, okay, it's one. They look like this. So they asymptote here towards the wall of the calico. And if so if you were continuing it through the all kind of the catacomb, they look like this in the first case. They look like this in the second case. And they look like this in the third case. So they reach, reach the boundary of this cone at infinite distance. The boundary of these cones in infinite distance, and the boundary in this case also in infinite distance. The only thing where the boundary is reached in finite distance is this boundary here in the first case. And these are precisely the Zoriski, the Zoriski wall. So this is happening if and only if, for the examples we check, for all, um, by the only parts of depowering two, which can be constructed in terms of story varieties or complete intersections, this happened if and only if. The next bonding wall was a was a risky wall. We can write down the we can solve the differential equation for the geodesic explicitly in these cases. I'll write them down. So for case one, the solution is T one is minus sin. Think squared some function of the curve parameter tau one third and T two is cos tan expression. That is R K of S is square root of three times some constant over A. And S plus the integration constant change. And so this comes from solving the, the ZDD equation subject to the, to the constraint that kappa is some constant. This has to be equal to six. This has a pretty reason that, that you're interested along curves of constant kappa. So the physics wise, this means that the volume of the color VL stays finite. Or, sorry, not say fine. The volume of the cardio does not change as long as you use it. And the reason why you impose this is because, again, if you do 11 the M theory and you complexify this, you, you get a physically, you get a modelized state of vector multiplets and modelized state of hyper multiplets. And the volume of the cardio is a hyper multiplet and the rest of the cardio column is sort of close to vector multiplets. So, this is the reason why we have to split. And you're only looking at the vector model that modelized phase and their volume is fixed. So it's not so surprising that so we, we are moving along along these um, fixed volume geodesics, and if the volume of the color VR goes to zero, then of course if you keep the volume fixed, this is at infinite distance. Also, this uh, so just like the sin squared and this cos squared, the structure sort of ensures that. Just by the addition, uh, just by the cost squared and squared is equal to one, this sort of puts you on this, on this uh, equal volume. Geodesics and the case two is simple. T1 is just A1 e to the, and again, some integration constant e to the over three S, and T2 is six over K, A1 squared. E to the minus two thirds e to the S. And so the last case, I found it amusing. It's not very enlightening, but I'll write on the 
the equation anyways, because I find it amusing. The T1 is minus three plus six times the cosh of some constant e to the over two s times the sin one third times the R cos of the times each other over two minus each other over two S. And the whole thing to the power one third. Only you can simplify this further. This is as far as I go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Good. So the last thing I want to say is, um, it, so this can be reached in finite distance, but if you look at the solution, you see that if you follow the if you follow the geodesic and you approach this, you're actually sort of running into this wall. You're crashing into this wall. You're, Crashing into this at infinite volume. So the curve parameter is such that you're getting faster and faster, such that you crash into this wall and you're reflected back out. So this is this is what, what happens if you just if you just plot this and if you take a derivative, you can see that it becomes it becomes infinite. So physically, I mean that's not physical. So physically, something is happening at these walls. Something is either preventing you from going there or it is making it finite again. And so Witten also discusses this, and he says there is an extra as a two gate symmetry appearing on these walls. And this is a vector multiplet space, so we would have to take them into account somehow, and then probably this would make this finite. But we haven't attempted to, to take these corrections into account. And so one last thing if, if you have a situation where you plot, so you plot your LDR. This also tells you if you have a plot wall, the plot wall cannot be any of these because plots are always at finite distance. So what's happening in these cases is the the cone of the Calabiao is always mapped to a sub into a sub cone here. So that yeah, these happen at finite distance. And if the one of the calicone generators is mapped to one of these boundary walls here, you know that. You're in a situation where you are in some sense at the last catacomb wall such that after this defective cone ends. That's that's all. Right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. If I could ask um, real quick, so someone had previously asked about the complexification of this picture, and you answered that you didn't want to get into that because uh, non-renormalization theorem no longer hold. But if, if you go down to type 2a on your CY3 and then go over to type 2b on the mirror, where, okay, I mean, now we can just write down the metric on this moduli space as the as Bay Peterson metric on the complex moduli space of the Clavio. Okay, can you get some understanding of the geodesic behavior and see what's going on in the limit that you take? Uh, whatever, like the radius of the M theory circle to infinity, how that recovers the picture that you're telling us now? That's uh, that's an excellent question. The question is, of course, I, I know the metric. I can compute this by mirror symmetry. Right, right, exactly. And, and then I could do the thing. I, I expect we can do this. We haven't tried. So the big event in this case was that so it's was so simple that we could actually solve the um, sure. easy equation analytically. This would most likely not be true if we included the uh, Included the uh, the quantum corrections. And you no, can... absolutely. But like you know, just do it numerically or something. Just well, you can do it numerically, absolutely. Yeah, no, we yeah. Yeah, it. yeah, it's a good question. So just take them into account. The quantum correction that you get closer to the wall, and then sort of compute it numerically. The the two easy to create. It's a very good point. We haven't we haven't done it. Yet. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank thank Fabian for the great talk. Thank you. And that's all for today. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll try to 
think so. That was really good. Thank you. <laughs> How is the giving a board talk again? It was good. It was fun. I haven't done it in a while. Hmm. So how about the level? I was really not sure what to expect from uh, the, the level. Oh, that's